Hello, everybody. This is Holy Foley, and I'm Dr. Vanessa Thiemament. And my guest today is Michael Filimovich, PhD and professor at Simon Fraser at University in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. Um, I knew Michael in Chicago at uh, Columbia in Chicago. And Michael is a fascinating combination of music and sound theorist with a background in game theory and studies, AI in film, and both music and sound in visual media. Michael has published many academic chapters and books, as well as edited books and journals on music and sound and film, which we're going to discuss today. So welcome, Michael, and it's uh, wonderful to see you. After all these years, we've known each other since the early 2000s, I think around 2006, 2007. Um, yep. And when we worked on a silly film called Baby Blues, and then we started doing some stuff together in Chicago, and we've been doing some writing together in academic uh edited editions, which I'm very grateful that you've included me in. And uh, we have a sound studies handbook coming out later on this year, which I think is very interesting. It's the first handbook on sound design um, for Rutledge. But um, I want to get started, if you don't mind, talking about what you're doing at Simon Fraser in Vancouver now, because you're originally from Chicago. You have your bachelor's in philosophy, which I have to say is one of my favorite majors of all time some of my favorite classes as an undergrad was were in philosophy and I read a lot of philosophy and consider myself extremely philosophical in my own way so the fact that you have a background in philosophy is interesting to me and explains a lot about the way you think frankly and then you have your master's in fine arts from the school of art art design in Chicago and then your PhD from Simon Fraser in Vancouver so Tell me a bit about what you're actually doing at Simon Fraser now. Okay, sure. So I, I teach in a school of interactive arts and technology, which is a multidisciplinary program. We've traditionally categorized our undergraduate offerings as uh, under the headings of media design and informatics um, or computation. And mm. that's being um, changed up a bit. But essentially, you know, we're, we're inter introducing a whole new range of concentrations, uh, things like interaction design, AI, um, what I, I've traditionally taught in the media art stream, and we're, we're renaming that to creative media, but essentially it's the audio visual media stream, um, which includes not just like sound and video, but also photography and storytelling and interactive video and so on. So I, I've been at SFU, like this is 2007, so that's about 17 years. Um, teaching media arts courses uh, across the board. So sound design, but also, you know, filmmaking, sto digital storytelling, digital photography, as well as a, a lot of our um, other kinds of courses like uh, media and cultural theory, the, the um, research writing course. I've even taught information design and front end web development. So it's a, it's a highly interdisciplinary program. Uh, and, uh, right now, my focus in the courses there are, uh, well, game. My, my, I have a focus right now on the sort of like large online service courses. So essentially courses that anyone in the university can take, <clears throat> mm -hmm. as well as obviously students in my own program. So, uh, so for example, I, I have a very large uh, inter game studies course, and that's about 250 students a semester. And it's designed for students from anywhere in the university. So it's non-technical. The main project is to, is to apply the game studies concepts and game theory concepts to a board game. So anybody can make a board game because it's just like, you know, cardboard right. and, and, and dice and so on. Um, and then I've recently redone my um, digital photography course and now it's called digital, virtual and AI photography. So I mm. am, uh, I've, what's changed there is it's a little bit uh, less, traditionally it's been focused on, using the, the, the studio, the, the shooting space and the lighting equipment and the pro camera equipment. And now I brought it out to basically saying people can use cell phones. So anyone in the university can take the course. And then we're doing, we're doing some AI image making and also virtual photography, which is making uh, 2D images in real time rendering environments like game engines. So I've, I've tried to make that course as forward looking as possible to, you know, in, kind of encompass all the forms of what we might call digital photography today. Because in a, in a, something like a real-time rendering environment, you are using, say, like uh, 
photogrammetry and scans of uh, high res high resolution scans of real world objects and environments and textures. So there's that strong photographic element to that. But even though you're working in something like uh, you know technology based on Unreal Engine and so on, so uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing at, at, at Simon Fraser for the last 17 years. Um, uh, I, I'm teaching faculty, so my focus is on the undergraduate curriculum. So I've been uh, teaching media arts across uh, the, the range there I, I just discussed. And uh, then I got my PhD. I completed my PhD at SFU in, in 2018. So that was just kind of using the, you know, the faculty benefit, you know, the tuition waiver. So Oh, how the, nice. So I basically it was just kind of you know, I you know, it was it was, just, it was basically using using a the the benefit that we all have as faculty to get free courses. Now, since so much of what you do though, what we do together when you're working on edited editions and I'm one of your contributors, it's always about sound in film, and so um like this latest hand studies this this handbook in sound design is going to be various entry points looking at the way sound, whether it be performative or um, different ways of design for sound in film, how that's going to work. So you're still keeping a lot of your interest in sound for film. So you've been working in visual media for a very long time, but you've been see working in the intersection of sound and film. And I remember when you started the film festival and conference called Cinesonica, which you did in Vancouver. Then it went to um, Northern uh, Ireland. And then I brought it over to Ball State, which the first time it was in the United States. And then it went back to Northern, your, um, in Northern Ireland. And this was a conference and festival with films that were sound to visual media and talking various academic entry points onto that. You've always kept your interest in sound as well, coming from the musical perspective. And so I'm wondering what you're doing with that right now. Yeah, right. Right now I'm focused on electronic music. Uh, I, I I haven't had it. I mean, I have actually just very recently worked on a, on a, on a short film. But, uh, you know, a few years ago, I, I decided to, um, I guess this would have been in I don't remember exactly. Maybe sort of before the pandemic shutdowns, and the the, the pandemic shutdown kind of happened simultaneous to like a sabbatical year for me. So it's all a bit of a blur in terms of what I was doing exactly when. But if yeah, a few yeah. years ago I decided to focus on electronic music. But I would also say too about like the the handbook of sound design and and most of my books with Rutledge have been very multidisciplinary. So there's always good representation from from film, but we also have representation from, from games and performance, installation, sonification, user experience. So I, since my first series with them, the, the foundations and sound design series, I I've been looking at sound design from a, a very multidisciplinary you know, kind of lens. So I've been focusing on electronic music, uh, but then I started making videos for them as well. So, and I've tried to you know, a range of techniques. Right now, my my main technique for music videos is, is using generative AI. So my last eight music videos have all been AI, you know, where the, uh, the visuals are produced by generative AI. Um, but yeah, and, and actually, actually, you know, my my own my master's degree at the RNC of Chicago, uh, my focus there was, should bro broadly speaking, they were called well, we we're called, we called sound art, I guess, very broad. I was actually the last time arts graduate at the um, school of RNC of Chicago. Like when I when I finally got my MFA, there was no there was no time arts program because it ended up getting reshuffled the, the programs and end up getting kind of reshuffled a lot but time arts at the time say like the late night in the 90s that was a kind of envelope of interdisciplinary uh, creativity that included sound video film installation performance even like kinetics like like robotic art and technology art and technology so um i would say mostly what i was doing in grad school for my master's was uh more or less electroacoustic 
music. Like my 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 master's thesis was a like a electroacoustic spoken word opera. So, so spoken word. Okay, slow down. <laughs> Because starting a long time singing, ago, that was a long, was spoken a long time word ago. opera. Explain that to those of us who might not really know what spoken word opera might be, other uh, than the sure. spoken chorus in theater. When I got my theater degree, there was a lot of Greek chorus, spoken chorus in Greek plays. So, what is spoken spoken chorus, spoken opera? Yeah, so it wasn't. It's not like when people think spoken word. It wasn't like that kind of like the the, the poetry slam kind of thing. Uh -huh. Basically, basically, I'd written a bunch of I'd written a bunch of poems. I'd written a, a suite of poems. I I think it was about twelve poems. I wrote, I wrote a suite of poems in three voices, and so I created characters. Uh, there were there were two male and one female characters of different ages, and um, I wanted them read as poems. Huh. And I didn't want, I didn't, and I, and I wrote them as poems I, and they weren't like, and, and, and so I created soundscapes and music to go with, with the poems. And then there was a narrative. There were, there was a, um, an, a you know, there, there was a suite of poems adding up to a kind of narrative about uh, a war, war in Europe, war, which is, I, I've been, I've been thinking about going back to that project in some ways recently about maybe doing some AI film treatments for it because now with with a situation in Ukraine, for example, I've right. been thinking. Um, uh, what essentially happened was like my very when I was in grad school, my very first like pro sound design gig where I was actually starting to make decent money to, as big sound design. It just ha it happened to be this um, ten part documentary series called "The Twentieth Century" is one video per decade, and in working on this series. I just was had I had to just kind of watch through all of this really fascinating archival black and white film footage of and you know with quite a lot of it having to do with war because there's a lot of war in the 20th century and I just got kind of mesmerized because so when you do sound design for these uh, kinds of documentaries of course you, I think you might know the, the these this these um old black and white film footage they're silent right because there's someone someone's shooting yeah so on, a, on a camera there's no sound but you know the demands of te television is that well you got to have soundtracks for the right. for all this sound you have to have sound effects for all this footage so quite a lot of what i was doing was just making up sound sound soundtracks to go with all this silent archival footage and i i got kind of hypnotized by just hours and hours and hours you know it just goes on for like half a year of this black and white <laughs> historical historical footage and then that just prompted like this 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 that basically was kind of in terms of the way my mind was absorbing all that visual information it it then turned out a suite of poems based on this imaginary war i i wanted a kind of anachronistic i didn't want to specify any particular war any particular country anything like that it was just it's just like this this imaginary of war uh -huh. basically and i so i wrote a series of poems and then i just that ended up being you know the the basis for uh what I, I call it, experimental electroacoustic spoken word um, opera. I, I didn't know what else to call it. That's just how I categorize it because you got to kind of label it or something. Um, but it, it was cool that after after my graduation, like I got a, a big art grant based on that. And uh, it's very different in the States. I, I kind of missed the States way where you can get a grant just by saying, here's some art I did. Isn't it cool? And like, oh yeah, that's cool. Here's some money. But it's very different from Canada where you have to basically make the the the, the committee part of the the, the project basically i had so. this idea it's really cool great here's some money <laughs> well i had to write it you know i did the artist statement and everything but, but i mean basically i didn't i didn't in canada like if you want to get an art grant like like let's say you want to hire someone who's going to solder some equipment for you the, the committee needs to have the resume it's like you have to make the committee the grants committee part of your the creative process in some kind of weird way that wasn't the case in the states in the states you can interesting just, you can just uh, now see that we in America, yeah. of course, have this impression that the way Canada does things is always superior. But what you're doing is showing in a more capitalistic country, it's actually can be more direct. Oh, yeah. And, and in a more capitalist country, you can actually buy capital. That's the weird thing about Canada. Like, you, you, like if you're a musician in Canada, you're not allowed to buy a synthesizer with a grant because that's like capital. All you can do is rent a synthesizer or pay or pay someone to play synthesizer for you, but you can't buy one because that'd be like buying gear with the with the grant money, which is which is a no no. It's huh. it's a, it's the weirdest thing, but like 
artists need equipment, <laughs> right? We all, right. Especially, especially in technology. So the, the nice thing about a cap country that i would say is that you can buy capital with art grant if you if you're an artist and you need gear you need you need whatever you need to buy some paint you can buy it uh in canada you can only rent or hire with the money you can't actually take the money and buy something with it that you might need but it's really nice to know that the direct exchange of a capitalistic system makes some things much easier i think so yeah i mean as, as a young artist i took the money as a down payment on a house so that was pretty that's very useful when you're young So tell me about your entry into using AI, because many of the people that I know from the professional end of film and film sound, and a lot of people in academia, professors who are finding the dangers of AI as far as um, what they have to do by making adjustments in the way they teach. And okay. they're trying, they're going back to some more old school ways of teaching, which I think might be very helpful, like having blue book um, exams and using handwriting. Hey, there's a thought and having them write handwriting in a classroom for an exam, which I think is actually very healthy. Um, what? How are you using AI and what got you into it? And if you can walk us through a process of how you might use, as you say, generative AI, for those of us that aren't involved with it, I'd be very curious. Okay, sure. Yeah, I've got a, a number of thoughts on that. So on the one hand, I, I almost, because of the kind of program I teach and I teach in, you know, the School of Interactive Arts and Technology, some of our, we have a few, some of our faculty are AI um, researchers slash AI artists. I almost just feel because of the nature of the kind of program I teach in, I almost have to embrace it because it's, it's almost like my job to stay. Because it, um, I, I, uh, tend to, you know, if I see a new technology or something, or whether it's a new technology or just another technology related to something I do, um, I, I'll often explore it. And and I've, I've done plenty of like putzing around in different, you know, whatever programming languages and apps and never, never gotten to kind of anywhere with them. Other things I've, I've, I've explored and I go, oh, and I, they've become part of my, my main practice. So, um, and so um, <clears throat> in the case of AI, uh, I started using it, I guess, I'm, well, I'm trying to think, there's, there's the, there's the text and, and there's the text and there's, there's the visual part, but I, I guess, I guess it, one way I would say it is this, you know, we all know that, you know, all, all artists, all writers, et cetera, you know, in not just, not just us creatives, but, you know, we all kind of stand on the shoulders of those who came kind of before us. Right. Sure. And, and. I just think a generative AI platform is just another way to do that, right? Because in, in that case, the shoulders are the database that the, that the machine learning algorithms have have trained on, right? So, if the um, the neural networks have extrapolated a series of you know probabilistic principles by analyzing you know self generating rules based on the data set of you know millions of images, that that is sort of just another way of like quote unquote like st standing on the shoulders of others, right? So it's, it's mm -hmm. um, I think of it as a, like a probabilities. To me, it's a new medium. Generative AI is essentially, essentially a way of um, working with with probabilities, right? Because that's that's what your that's what the output is. Yeah, the, the 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 algorithms traverse a kind of probability space uh, based on your prompts, and it is and it's and it's strangely collaborative because you are kind of working with another like you know artificial brain. You, you don't you never get exactly what you want out of the system, but you start getting some interesting things, and it becomes like this. It becomes very dialogic. Like it, you're having it, it. It's a system that you end up having kind of a dialogue with because, um. You know, in terms of process, like for example, I found that it, it can often be pretty hard to like if you come at it with too strong a vi like to, to a project but too strong a vision of exactly what you want I, I find that to be almost an impossible 
to get because the system just will not generate exactly what you want. But that, so right. you have to be kind of kind of open minded as opposed, to, you know, in terms of like where the project might go based on what you're able to get out of the system. And some of the most important prompts are the ones you don't, you never use because the ones, the ones that didn't work are the ones that help you find the ones that did, that do work to get the, to get the, to get the kind of visuals that you want. Uh, so, so, so wait, yeah. so you, so by seeing yeah. what the AI does that you don't want to use, you know, how to re go back and restart it to get something that you do want to use. Yeah, all basically it's like all those prompts that didn't work, they're like the equivalent of like all the footage on the cutting room floor floor that you never end up using, right? Because right, like the like was a Hitchcock who said film was like life without a boring bits cut out. Like you have to end up you have to you need some process of elimination to get rid of all the stuff that doesn't work in order to find like the 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 great stuff that does work. Um so I found, you know, because right now at the current state of, of generative AI with like video, you can't really get like a, a consistent character all the all the way through. So I, I find my two my two main strategies are to either, well, so overall, what because I use them for music videos and music videos a form that's very like montage friendly. Obviously, it's all about it's usually all very heavily montage. Right. So what what I what I end up doing is create a kind of hybrid between narrative and montage so there's a narrative there ends up being a kind of a narrative structure even though moment by moment it's kind of montage -y. um and <laughs> so one way one way to do it is you can kind of just create a very complex space and then explore it mm -hmm. so that's one strategy the other strategy is to tell a narrative across a population of characters where there's like where there's it's like an alien invasion right that affects the whole planet earth so you can have a bunch of aliens and a bunch of scenes across you know go in and out of spaceships and in different cities so that, that's like an idea of like it's it's a narrative that works across a, a large population of like aliens invade earth mm -hmm. right so so those are my two strategies you know exploring a complex scene or telling a story across a population given like the current state of um where, where the, the technology is at but uh i you know i'll give an example like a couple couple now, months ago, I went to a rap party. So I mentioned I worked on this the short the short film. He said it's nine minute, nine minute uh, short film. Uh, it was almost all students. So basically, one of my PhD students, um, he got a bunch of undergrads to to do this short film for that he wants to you know he's sending off to the film festivals and and, and so on. So we we did the went to the rap party. And then we also just played some of my music videos there too, just as you know, just to kind of just because I was there, I looked in the film. And you know, someone at someone at the party said, So how long did it take? You know, because they, they used After Effects, 2D animation using After Effects. And mm -hmm. someone asked, like, well, how long does how long did this animation take you? And he's like, Well, we worked on worked on this for like about two years. And then someone asked me, Well, how how long does it take you to do one of your music videos? I said, like, like one working day. So <laughs> So, you know, I mean, there's it takes you know it it takes four minutes to generate four seconds of video, but you can but if you just do four seconds, four seconds, four seconds, um, you're done at you know one one long day. You know, take a lunch break and you're done. Um, so it's 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 extremely. But do you have to storyboard it and plan it first? That's not my process. Um, because it's, because it, because there's there's short pieces of music like three and a half four minutes long. Um, I. I think you need plans and outlines for longer pieces. Like if it was like a novel or a feature film, but like for a poem or like a, sh a short short story or or sh short piece of music, 
um, I, I, I think you, you, you need a seed idea and then you, you just unpack the seed. Right. So, you, you know, I see. So if it's, it's, it's a big complicated work. Yeah. You need to plan like, like do a blooper, but if it's just a song, I, I have an, an initial seed and I just, it's like, and it's like doing a poem. I just, I just, I, it's like when, when you write a poem, um, you, uh, might just have an image in mind and you just sort of unpack that image until the poem's done. And it's just kind of like that, you know, cause you don't and need Where are you happen. getting the music? I make the music. It's my music. Sure, music. Yeah. And what are you doing with these music videos? Uh, I exhibit them in film festivals. Oh. Um, I mean, it's not, I have I have them on YouTube and so on, but basically, and I also, I use my creative work, my own creative work as uh, the basis for a lot of the content for like my blog. Uh, so I have, I have a number of blogs and I also have a, a lot of Udemy courses based on my SFU courses, but um yeah, so we, you know, in the last few months, I've won two two awards for the music videos, um, one in Spain, and then uh, recently won another video, won best animation at the California Music Video Awards, which is and they're produced by a public television uh, station out of, in the Bay Area, and they have a they have a national TV TV show called Music California. Music and, California. Yeah. What genre is the music? My music, well, I call I can I I would label my music as post genre because it what, what I mean by that is essentially it uses it um it draws from recognizable music electronic music genres, but it doesn't. But I don't I don't produce genre music, but it gotcha. I, I, I I borrow elements from genre music. So so it was it was it was in the viewer it was shortlisted for viewers' choice um, best EDM. But I don't really think of it as an EDM track, but I don't mind if people think it's EDM. Um, but it's, yeah, it's essentially, it's it's in a kind of, you know, I, I borrow from a lot of electronica type styles, like related styles, I guess. So um, do you see yourself going forward with using artificial intelligence in the use of sound design or anything like that? Probably not. And the way I put it is that I don't want AI to have all the fun. Like it, it's, so, because there has to be something for me yeah. to do, like for all of to do. all of for all, of, you know, there, you know, there's look, art isn't just about making some artifact and saying, oh, I made this thing. It's also about like what you get out of it personally as like self development yes. and, and pushing your own imagination. And I, I think right now I, I have like the perfect blend where I, I make electronic music kind of like the traditional way using a digital audio workstation and. and analog synthesizers and or, or, or um, visual programming languages and so on. Uh, but then I just use AI for to do to make the video for it. And I, I to me that's 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 perfect because with because because the the kind of skill and craft to, you know cause, because with each video I can completely change the style in, in a way that I'm, I'm not an animator, you know, I, I don't have a you know, it, it's to me, it just it just makes me very productive in terms of being able to like create these visual universes to go with my music. Mm -hmm. But I, but if I had AI do everything, there'd be nothing for me to really do that as an artist.
I also think that AI, this is the discussion I have with so many people who are in the industry, um, especially when it comes to the Foley artists, of course, because that's very organic and very performative. It's very much like acting, but with the sonic part of it. It's a soulful part. It's the performative part. It's in the moment. And that's very hard for AI to um, duplicate because AI is learning something that has to be taught to it, but it cannot really be in the moment as a human being with the soulful experience of what is happening. And that's a very different kind of thing. So, but you're bringing up something that nobody's really thought of. And that is where would the fun for us be if we don't get to be the creators? Yeah, exactly. Like, like what would be the point if I can, if, if every last point thing was all through prompt prompt writing, um, so much enjoyment um, would just be missing. And if anything, I've been, I've been really wanting to get more and more analog with sound. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in grad school um, my, for my master's working with the acoustics of materials. And I used to make my own sound, instruments and sound objects. And you, you can, there are sounds that you can get when you just go to the hardware store and just start finding things that make sound and you put them together and it puts some contact mics onto well, them. Well, now you're talking about music concrete. Um, yeah, well, not so much with recordings of the environment, but basically making my own sound making objects based on how the, how the you know, the acoustics of how things sound. Yeah. And um, I have I have played with some of this like prompt writing, like text to sound mm -hmm. and, I, um, and it, the sounds were horrible. And I, I, I tried, I tried it for, uh, I don't know, maybe I spent a whole hour or something. And I think, gosh, I, I, it's just sounded terrible. Uh, I th think things are much further along in music because AI has been around in composition for like decades. Like there's David right. Cope's, David Cope's book with like, you know, having an AI system generate, you know, box sounding fugues. That's, that's like decades old. Sure. Kind of. so, so AI for like notes and patterns is 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 pretty robust um some of the midi tools i use in my daw um have some kind of ai or you know pseudo ai kind of algorithmic component to it and I, I think those are those are okay to use as a as an element but i kind of feel like if i'm not sitting there and making creative decisions and making judgments and exploring like that's all the fun of for me to make of making art and i so i i need to have enough there that I, I feel like I'm getting what I need as an artist out of the process. And, but then I don't have to do everything myself. And, if, and like I said, like with, the, with, um, uh, you know, with, with, with the videos and instead of spending, you know, a hundred thousand dollars and hiring some animators, I can just do it in a day. So, you know, I, it's I feel funny. Like, yeah. two things come to mind from what you're saying, although the people who hire us would always be thinking about how to save money, but even then I'm not really sure AI saves money as much as a really well-honed professional but two things come to mind the first thing is the book man's search for meaning um about how um the purpose of life is really about finding meaning in whatever it is we're experiencing even if it's suffering so when you talk about having the fun having the experience of mm -hmm. meaning in whatever it is we're doing even if it's unpleasant or painful or hard is always what life really comes down to is the search for meaning in whatever it is we're doing. So that's the first thing that comes to mind out of the book, Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. The second thing that comes to mind is the opening of What's Upon a Time in the West because Marconi, they had tried, that they wanted to do the whole movie based on the actors walking to Marconi's score on the set and acting to it and having this whole sense of the score being the sense of the setting the rhythm and the whole sense of reality for the film and then they would replace and because they were doing it um, with the sense of sound being replaced after having the sound come in after but it wasn't working for the opening scene and Morcone went to a concert and saw a man do an entire I think it was the second act or something with a wooden ladder and it came from the sense of music music concrete where natural objects in the world make the, the sounds and they're very musical and then of course being a foley artist i always think in terms of the music of all the sounds on a foley stage so he watched this man create the entire performance of all the different sounds that you make from a ladder 
And he was so mesmerized that he came back and he told Leone, I have the solution to the opening 10 minutes, the opening of the film, Once Upon a Time in the West. And it was to have the entire opening. And it was it's mostly Foley. There are a couple of sound effects like the windmill. Um, and there are a couple of ADR lines like the old man going, <laughs> you know, a couple of things. Um, but mostly it's Foley. And it's the whole sense of the creating the whole sense of the reality and the relationship with the organic sound and the whole sense of the forebodingness and the characters being done by what they're wearing and what they're walking and the way they're moving around. And he got this whole sense of it from this man working with a ladder and creating an entire sense of a story and a sense of storytelling and reality and musicality from a ladder. I believe it was a wooden ladder. Yeah. And ex- yeah. So those two things you come about with a sense of having a sense of purpose and meaning from whatever comes to you and then creating art from whatever you are given rather than trying to reach for something and have it do it for you. Yeah, I had an experience like that in grad school for my master's. As, um, I took a composition class where the um, the textbook was a manuscript in progress of the the, the, the professor was writing a book for on, on on music and cognition for MIT Press. And but it was it was a is a is a music composition course or sound composition course. And at, basically, we had to choose. The an instrument on the first day of class, we had to choose what's our instrument going to be for the entire semester for 15 weeks. Mm. And we had to do all of our composition exercises with that instrument. And I, I chose a, a metal pot from my kitchen as my <laughs> instrument. And I had to extract just like the widest range of, of possible acoustic material I can get out of that pot for like 15 weeks. It was such a, it was it was such, such for me, it's a very foundational experience, and just just a, such a great experience of thinking like, how can, how can I get more sound out of this thing? This this this. And it wasn't even like a very attractive. It was very. It's kind of a dented, ugly pot, actually. But um, which actually makes it more fun. <laughs> but uh, I I found I found a lot of ways to get some cool sounds out of that thing, and so yeah, I I think that that was that's that was a big part of. Did you have to write about it too, or just experience it? Not in that course. No, that was that I was see. just a, that was just a studio course, and we just had to, huh. you know, it was a, you know, and yeah, we just had to, we just had to make stuff and bring it in and talk about it and critique it and, and listen to other stuff that he he play on the, in the studio, you know. So and it, everyone chose different kinds of instruments, and some people might have actually used like a synthesizer or something like that. But um, yeah, I was uh, I, I I had I had the pot. Well, I think we're going to end it on that note because I love that ending right there. Thank you, Michael. Oh, you're welcome.